And the reason we have to focus on things that are available now is that if you buy a car today, somebody in this country is going to be driving that car for the next 16.8 years. That means that if we talk about all sorts of pie-in-the-sky, far-off technologies that politicians love to throw R&D money on, like hydrogen fuel cells, that take 20, 30, 40 years to come to fruition, if ever, we're still going to have to wait that 16 to 17 years to turn over the fleet. Okay, so we're going to talk about what's available today and how, with straightforward policy, we can help change the situation. And we have to keep in mind one thing. When we're dealing with the global oil market, we're not dealing with a free market. We're dealing with, you heard about cartels before? Well, you're really dealing with a cartel. And that cartel is OPEC. And the reason that oil prices are high are not because China and India are growing and consuming more oil. That's a good thing, right? It's a good thing that the economies of China and India are growing and hundreds of millions of people are rising out of poverty. The reason that oil prices are high is that we're dealing with a cartel that's deliberately been constraining supply. Let's talk about some numbers here. 35 years ago, OPEC, the countries of OPEC, produced 30 million barrels of oil a day. You know how much the countries of OPEC produce today? And keep in mind, the countries of OPEC sit on three quarters of the world oil reserves. You know how much they produce today? 32 million barrels of oil a day. In the intervening 35 years, non-OPEC supply has doubled. Non-OPEC countries, in response to a global economy that has been growing at a furious pace, increased their production. The natural reaction of free market players. But OPEC, which controls three-quarters of world oil reserves and therefore has the most ability to expand supply, has deliberately kept its supply low. And that is why, as China and India have grown, OPEC has not increased supply. That is why, as terrorist attacks have disrupted oil in Nigeria, as riots disrupted oil in Venezuela, other countries did not increase supply. In fact, last year, two new countries joined OPEC. Ecuador and Angola. Now together, these two countries were producing 2.4 million barrels a day. The oil, global oil market is about 85 million barrels of oil a day, okay? Together, these two countries were producing about the amount of what a Norway produces. So they joined OPEC. Now what did OPEC do in response? Did it increase its quota to reflect the fact that two new countries from non-OPEC shifted to the OPEC roster? No, it did not. So in an accounting trick, essentially, OPEC stole, stole 2.4 million barrels a day from the world oil market. The other countries on the OPEC roster simply reduced their supply. That's what happened. That's what we're dealing with. That's why prices are high. That's why when you hear drill here, drill now, great, I'm all for domestic production. But you look at the historical record and you'll see something very interesting. In fact, OPEC has these graphs on its website. What happens every time non-OPEC drills more? OPEC drills less. It's a precise mirror image. We drill more, they drill less. That's not to say we shouldn't develop our domestic supplies of energy of all types. That is to say that that is not going to be enough. All right, so let's talk about how to break OPEC and how to inject competition into the transportation sector. First thing. Let's look at what some other countries are doing. Now you may be aware of what's going on in Brazil. Every new car, well 90% of new cars sold in Brazil this year are flexible fuel vehicles. Every single car that General Motors sells in Brazil is a flex fuel vehicle. A flex fuel vehicle is a car that is essentially looks and performs exactly like a regular car. It has an internal combustion engine, it has a liquid fuel tank. But it can also run on any combination of gasoline and a variety of alcohol fuels. Now, alcohol does not just mean ethanol. And ethanol does not just mean corn. In this country, we produce ethanol from corn. In Brazil, ethanol is produced from sugar cane. That's right. It's cheaper to produce ethanol from sugar cane than it is from, from corn. It's a much more efficient process. 
And Brazil is far from the only country capable of producing sugarcane. There's some 100 countries around the world with a suitable climate for growing sugarcane. Many of them are on the receiving end of U.S. development aid. Now, it costs an automaker $100 extra, $100 extra, to make a car a flex fuel vehicle as compared to a gasoline only car. Every new car sold in this country should be a flex fuel vehicle. Just as every new car is required by law to have seat belts, every new car is required to have airbags, and in fact, by law, every new car is required to have FM radio. For national security reasons, by the way, put into place during the Cold War. I kid you not. Now, if every new car is a flex fuel vehicle, then what do you have? You have a platform on which fuels can compete. You have the key to breaking the monopoly of oil. You have a platform on which fuels can compete, so a consumer can go to the pump, and choose which fuel he or she wants to put in the car. Now, let's talk about some very ridiculous things. We don't impose a tax on oil imports, right? But we impose a 54 cent a gallon tariff on ethanol imports. 54 cent a gallon. If we had the same tax on a barrel of oil, you know how much that would be? On an energy equivalent basis, it would be a $23 a barrel tax. Okay, why are we not riding in the streets over this? That's right. This is not because of the oil lobby, big oil. Right? This is because of the farm lobby. So that tariff has got to go. Politically, it's not going to be possible to remove that tariff until we have a law that says new cars sold in this country need to be flex fuel vehicles. And we can talk. All right. So ethanol, one alcohol. In this country made from corn. And I just want to emphasize one thing. I hate subsidies and ag subsidies at least as much as any of you. But let it be clear, when oil hits $45 a barrel, corn ethanol is probably the most economic use for corn without subsidies. So keep the fact that we hate subsidies aside, that doesn't delegitimize the fact that this is a perfectly fine fuel. It's a separate issue.